everybody, welcome. Um, I'm Sarah Gardner Stanley, and I'm Shaka Dudu, and we are uh, facilitating this conversation today: um, climate change co-design. Uh, just before we start, uh, on behalf of uh, the Folda Festival, thank you so much for coming to this conversation, um, and especially after uh, what was a really great trip to uh, Thousand Islands Playhouse, but. Uh, it's hump day in Folda Land, which is day two of a three-day adventure. So um, we're really happy to have this get to have this uh, conversation with you and for the opportunity to um, share some thoughts and uh, hopefully do some co-design around the question of uh, climate change. We have some, some specific parameters. It's not around the, the vastness of it, although it does tend to fall into that occasionally. Um, and also just a, a shout out to uh, Hal Round, who's live streaming this. Um, thank you for all the live streams throughout the Folded Festival and to being such a fantastic partner um, throughout. Um, both uh, Chantal and I had worked separately with Hal Round even before we met, so um, there's a lot of tributaries and cross crossing over, so um, we're really thrilled for uh, this shared uh, cross-border initiative that's happening. So thanks to Hal Round. Um, yeah, so today, climate change co-design. Um, Chantel, mm -hmm. can you talk about your experience and history and how you've come to this question of uh, climate change first, and then we can give you a bit of background for the conversation. Yes, so I am originally a playwright, and um, I, in the last, uh, so I started, you know, as any playwright would, uh, writing plays about different subjects, but then over the last 10 years, my work has focused um, entirely on the intersection of arts and climate change. So, um, and this uh, manifested itself, uh, I guess I was interested in climate change in my personal life, because uh, I like to be outdoors and I like to go hiking, but it was a trip to Alaska um, in 2007 that, um, that made me make this change. And uh, the reason it happened was because the trip was a year after um, Al Gore's first movie, An Inconvenient Truth, came out. So the climate change was much more in the mainstream conversation. And being in Alaska, where the changes were evident and people were experiencing them firsthand way before we, uh, you know, in the rest of the Canada and the US um, were paying really close attention, uh, made me want to start investigating further. So after that trip, um, I got a commission to write a play. And because I'm originally from Canada, I started looking at what was going on in the Canadian Arctic. And so I wrote this play um, that's set in the Canadian Arctic. And in the process of writing this play, um, you know, I did all of this research, got really fascinated by what I was learning, and I figured out that, I discovered that there was much more I wanted to say that I could fit in one play. Um, and it was a way also to like, because I had to remove all of my really interesting research from the play, and I was like, oh, this is so good. So if I wrote more than one play, then I could use that in some other work. And um, so then I started looking for a container, like if I'm going to write more plays about this, what is it going to be? And um, I came up with, so in the Arctic there's this uh, body, non-governmental non body called the Arctic, uh, the Arctic Council, and um, it's eight member countries, all the countries that are within the Arctic. So I decided, okay, I'm going to write one play for each, that's set in each of these countries. So that gives me a sense of the, what's um, similar and what's different. And also, because it's going to take me a while to do this, um, when we look back on the whole body of work, we'll have, hopefully, we'll have a, um, a sense of our evolution with this um, subject over time. Um, so, so that was the, the beginning. And um, I'm extremely slow. So two plays have been written, produced, published, but I'm still on the third one. And so that's in 10 years, so I have to hurry up if I want to get to the end of eight <laughs> before you know I'm all gray and <laughs> done with writing. Um, but in the process of doing that, then um, at f so this was 10 years ago, and I felt pretty isolated because there were not that many people around me. There was nobody around me who I could tell was um, uh, focused on these issues. So. I, then I started creating other things um, because I was looking for things and not finding them. So the first thing I created was um, this uh, online platform called Artists in Climate Change, where artists from all disciplines who engage with climate change issues will write about their own work um, or be interviewed, and we have somebody doing podcasts now. And so that was a way of finding who else was uh, doing this work and a way of... Um, 
uh, creating a, a sense of community for us, but also a sort of um, database where people could find us and see the work that was being done. Like, this is important. A lot of people are doing it. Here's, you know, here's where you can find it. Um, and then uh, next after that, um, I wanted uh, more playwrights to engage with this question. I wanted more work to circulate, and I wanted uh, more voices to be heard. So. Um, along with two uh, co-founder, we created uh, this project, Climate Change Theater Action, which happens every other year. So the first one was in 2015, 2017, and then again this year. And um, the model of a theater action already existed. It was Kara Dadsvich who um, created it ar around different issues, but we sort of, uh, she, and she was one of the co-founders, so we took that model and then we sort of expanded on it. So. Um, what happens is we commission, so every two years we commission 50 playwrights from around the world to make sure that all continents are represented. And they each write a five minute play that engages with an aspect of climate change. And then we take this collection of 50 plays and we say to anybody, if you want to create an event like in a window of like 12 weeks that coincides with the COP meetings, the United Nations COP meetings, um, you can have access to these plays for free. Like, it's royalty free. You can do whatever. It can be like a reading with your friends in your uh, living room. You can do a really public event. You can add more material. As long as you use one of the, the plays from the collection, you can add more plays by local playwrights. You can do, you know, you can have singers. So it's, it's really, really open. And um, it has been a way to sort of bring more activism into the work also because we ask people uh, who, who will present events, can you um, include an action as part of your presentation? So in an action, again, you can decide what that is. It can be um, some people have uh, collected donations and then given that money to environmental organizations. Some people have brought in the, um, the League of something voters. Um, to talk to people about, about the importance of voting, um, looking at the, um, the platform that their uh, representative have to deal with climate change. Um, sometimes it's about food, so it's a whole range of things. And um, that's number three. And then the last of the initiatives was another thing I was looking for that I couldn't find was um, bringing artists together who engage with these issues to talk and further the conversation. Because, I mean, it's nice to think about this in isolation, but if we want the work that emerges from these concerns to become more and more sophisticated, we have to be able to talk to each other, and also we have to be able to support each other and to um, maybe have a common vocabulary for how we present ourselves to the world. So. Uh, three years ago, I was looking for something like that, couldn't find it, and, and so I created uh, what we call the incubator, uh, which is a five day long uh, mix think tank workshop where we bring in um, speakers every day, and then there's a series of conversation and um, exercises that stems from that. And uh, I just did one uh, in Alaska a few weeks ago, and then there's one coming up in July in New York City. And this is how I actually met Sarah, because she came uh, last year to the incubator that was um, in New York City. Cool, yeah, thank you. Um, so one of the um, things uh, that I do in my life is I'm the <coughs> Associate Artistic Director at the National Arts Center English Theater. And uh, I started there in 2013, and um, when I arrived, Jill Kiley, who some of you met, um, asked me to think about the question of, uh, at that time, it was referred to as First Nations work uh, in Canada. Um, and that led to the creation um, of the cycle, of which uh, I've uh, created and led now the third cycle. But the first was um, uh, one that culminated in a in a two-year project looking at the indigenous body of work, uh, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. And um, as, a, as a happenstance, and a glorious happenstance, gave birth to the uh, indigenous theater department at the National Arts Center, which is launching in the fall of 2019. That wasn't the plan, but it was the inevitable outcome. Um, it is the, uh, the core of this land, 
Uh, these are the oldest stories, and uh, these are the ways that we can reconstruct um, an idea of, of who we are together on this land at this time. So that was a two-year, uh, wonderful, life-changing um, uh, event that got named The Cycle once I realized that year one was about meeting with certain people, uh, working in a very, uh, uh, very uh, intimate way, and then moving to a second year where we would work with a much larger group of people, expand the field, as it were, and then move it into a public format at the end. Uh, in the first cycle, I worked with a wonderful uh, playwright, director, um, elder, and artist, uh, Yvette Nolan, um, and uh, we uh, together um, devised an approach, which in the first year, um, at the time, this was, I guess, 2014, uh, seemed really um, terrifying, uh, whereby we invited um, 12 um, uh, leaders from the uh, across sort of the indigenous realm of theater performance, um, and we invited ten institutional leaders. I think I have the math right, but the goal was to outnumber the leaders um, with um, indigenous artists and leaders, and to uh, silence with purpose the institutional leaders and turn them into listeners and. Um, see whether the indigenous leaders would feel comfortable enough to speak if they knew that they wouldn't be interrupted through the course of the, the two and a half days. It was held at the Banff Center. Um, it was uh, an extraordinary time. Um, there were um, incredible outcomes, not the least of which was we posited, uh, kind of with purpose, but um, this question of let's look at the indigenous canon of work. And uh, Jani Lozon, who's an incredible performer and uh, director and writer in her own right, at the time said, uh, did a whole sort of breakdown of what canon represents in the English language. And from that moment, it shifted to the indigenous body of work. And there was a re-energizing around uh, gathering of various data around all the works that existed to the point where within a year, there was over 400 works that were known, that were accessible, that uh, were facts, material facts of the amount of work. And people had to suddenly go, oh, really? You know, when artistic directors or presenters or people were like, well, I don't know where, you know, that sort of in some ways silenced that particular question. Um, and in the second year, uh, we moved to uh, Manitoulin Island to a uh, Dabaj Majig uh, Storytelling Theater, um, which is just uh, off Waquemekong Reserve. And, um, it, was the, it was a shift that was not planned whereby we did the investigation on uh, indigenous land. Uh, we were invited onto indigenous land to hold this conversation and this question. Um, and, uh, and we worked in a much different collaborative uh, model than what we'd set out to work with at the outset because we understood um, from an institutional perspective, through institutional thinking, um, Obviously not all of the areas of blockage, but at least some of the areas of blockage were kind of unblocked and the ways in which we approached the questions around indigeneity and how that uh, it was connecting to what was understood to be Canadian theater performance um, were opened up, the conversation opened up, and there was uh, quite, a, quite an expanse at the end. It culminated in a thing called the repast, which was a two, two and a half day public event that was live streamed um, and is still accessible on the NAC website. Some very um, wonderful conversations, a lot of uh, deep uh, critique, learning, and engagement, um, and, uh, and some incredible performance that people at that time weren't allowed to see if they weren't in the room because of the Canadian Actors' Equity Association, which has now since changed. Um, but at the time, indigenous performers couldn't show their work because of those um, association uh, stoppages. So a lot of things to be sort of sorted out over time. Um, I'm giving you a little bit of this background because it sets up the mission that we hope for this co-design session today. Um, the second cycle was looking at deaf disability and mad arts through an inclusive lens. I began the work with Alex Balmer, who's sitting to my left. Um, and we started uh, in year zero, before the cycle began, with something that we termed the Republic of Inclusion, which we did in Toronto for a day, with the key goal of trying to understand what the various intersections were that were making it difficult for people coming at the question of 
uh, disability arts and inclusion from being able to communicate in um, any kind of balance or harmony with one another. Uh, we worked on this, on this afternoon with Jan Derbyshire on a, um, uh, a co-design for how to re-establish uh, a long table from a, a, a Republic of Inclusion model which ended up um, culminating in three hours to build a 20 minute long table which happened with uh, basically the setup that we're sitting in now, uh, no table and I can't remember what uh, all the other things that were there that were so different from what we'd begun from. But um, most critically and I think most importantly was that the, the, the voice that ended up closing the session um, was a, a person who would identify as nonverbal, um, and that was the loudest voice and the most um, critical voice that ended that session. So to me, in terms of looking at uh, how to sort of come to these questions and shift the power dynamics, um, areas of co-design end up being emblematic to, to me of a, of a really good process to move forward because there's no way that I and I think I or Alice could have come to that together. That was a feature of all the people in the room um, uh, coming up against one another's needs. Um, that ended up uh, giving us enough confidence to move forward into the second cycle, which again, this is through the National Arts Center. Um, and uh, I shifted to uh, co-curating with Cyrus Marcus Ware who is a visual artist, primarily a performance artist, um, uh, a trans man who um, was one of the founders of Black Lives Matter uh, Toronto, um, an incredibly engaged activist who was also doing his PhD in environmental studies at, um, uh, at York. And I bring this up because when I started the cycles, I didn't know that each cycle would end up dovetailing almost always into the next conversation and that no conversations could be separate from another, uh, which um, ended up leading through the, that two-year cycle um, into a, uh, a, perform a performance outcome called the Republic of Inclusion, again live streamed, uh, where we worked with artists from across Canada and all, all over the world um, in what was termed a psychedelic symposium. Mm -hmm. Um, by, its, uh, by its conclusion. We worked with electronic musicians, videographers, and uh, in the final day of that event, uh, we worked towards co-designing a space that would make it possible for everyone who was present in the room to participate to their fullest uh, desire in a culminating song um, performed by uh, the musicians who had been with us throughout the duration of the time. Um, so we go into each of these things with, with a goal. <clears throat> Bringing us to the final cycle, and it is the final cycle, which is climate change, reimagining the footprint of Canadian theater. Um, when I started working on this and knowing that I would be doing it about four or five years ago, um, more often than not, people would ask if I'd heard of Chantal Bilido, who I had heard of, but I had not met. And we didn't indeed meet until last summer when I went to the incubator in New York and spent five days um, basically having my innards rearranged. Um, my, uh, my, um, my sensibilities surrounding um, how I walk upon the earth um, altered and very odd because I was doing it in one of the largest, um, well, the largest North American city um, and, uh, and going to see Broadway shows at night and looking for, you know, um, images and ideas about climate change in uh, Spongebob, of which there were many. But, uh, in any case, um, this final uh, cycle had its first foray um, in April in, uh, in Banff. And uh, Sophie has been working with us as, a, as an assistant curator, and, um, and we hope will be <laughs> joining us next year, Sophie Trophy you met earlier. Um, and uh, what, what we did was um, we gathered with about 12 institutional leaders from across the country and eight inspi nine inspirers from the United States, Canada, and the UK. And, and Australia. And Australia, sorry. And, and something that's very important and critical to this question, and something that I have learned over the course of this time. Um, I'm queer, and so I've been to um, one queer conference uh, called the Q2Q conference in Vancouver, which was the first of its kind in Canada. Um, and 
I, I, when I was there as being an organizer of so many of these things, I, I was aware of what it feels like to be the um, object under, uh, under review, the person under review. Um, and, and what I come, I've come to learn with these cycles is that when we looked at the indigenous body of work, there was, albeit it's massive, there's 600 plus nations on this land, um, it's a particular group of human beings who are dealing with a particular set of questions, even though they're coming at it from very diverse places. Um, when we moved into the second cycle and looked at deaf disability and mad arts through an inclusive lens, um, the exponents, the variables, were massively expanded. And so uh, it meant that the intersections were so, uh, so inc incredibly vibrant and alive that to, to be candid and, and frank, it was very difficult to get to theater. Because how, how? when there's so many different um, desires, needs, um, wishes, and uh, uh, ways into the question of what, what it is to perform. Mm -hmm. When we get to climate change, uh, there's absolutely no human being, and as Milton raised the other day, no being who is outside of the question. So it's, it's an expanding and expanding and expanding way to kind of think about the narratives that we are holding as humans at this moment in time. So to that end, it changes everything. And so it meant to me that when we had this third cycle, that there was nobody in the room who was actually an expert. <laughs> There was nobody who could bring a lived experience of climate change. Um, people could bring different ways into their lived experience of climate change, absolutely. But there was nobody who could say, I have a lived experience of climate change. Um, and therefore, this is, the, the, this is a perspective that will have a much broader reach. We all had to bring our own uh, cognizance and understanding and questions about what our own lived experience of climate change is at present, what our fears are that it might be into the future, and what our knowledge of what it was previous to this conversation. However, there are some really inspiring people who have been doing unbelievable work, of which uh, the honor I feel of getting to work with Chantal on this is already extraordinary. But then bringing into the mix um, um, a psychotherapist who's dedicated her life to grief studies as it pertains to um, the environment, or climatologists who have uh, who went into um, uh, the academy because they wanted to learn about the climate and realized if they're interested in the climate, that now de facto means they have to be climate change people, which their anger about that, which was such an awakening for me. Um, <coughs> Alison Tickle, who uh, Tickle, who works uh, with Julie's Bicycle in the UK, who has made enormous policy changes that have gone right through the whole artistic infrastructure of how arts uh, organizations are making work, thinking about work, and the criteria and the and the, um, the the places that they have to meet to be able to even get funded to do work. Um, she came out at, uh, as a cellist and has now dedicated her life to doing that. Even your story, Chantal, of being a playwright and then moving into this because there was a need to kind of really push this forward. So these inspirers brought to us uh, some real knowledge. And our job now, along with the inspirers moving forward, is to, to, um, to move into year two. And year two is um, divided into hubs and we're looking for some values. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about, about that and then hopefully I won't have to say too much more. Um, we're calling the public um, conclusion of the third cycle hub space. And we're looking to um, perform and exist within likely eight hub spaces um, across Canada, the UK, Australia, and the United States. For those of you who are here for Choir, 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 you saw a very um, elemental um, beta test of some of the thinking that we're planning for um, Hub Space 2020, which we're planning on culminating as part of FOLDA 2020. Um, the notion is, is that there will be eight spaces, retreats in, uh, in various cities 
um, across, uh, like I say, Canada, the UK, um, uh, I don't want to say across the globe because it's so not in those particular countries. Um, but they won't be at office computers, they'll actually be in retreat spaces. Um, and we're looking at how to uh, investigate uh, lessening carbon footprint, um, what it means to work in smaller groups, um, kinship, what it means to work with two scientists, two artists, two students, and an artistic coordinator and maybe a tech person um, in each of these spaces. Um, and what it will mean to connect from Melbourne to Iqaluit, if bandwidth makes it possible, to uh, St. John's, Newfoundland, to Vancouver, to Boston, to um, London, UK, and to have some shared conversations about what the lived experience in those areas are. Um, and then to create works based on the time that is shared together over about a nine day period. Those nine days will culminate in the public hub space that will be performed in theaters, mainly here, but in theaters in those other cities, in a concurrent and ongoing way. So part of the co-design question is, how are we gonna do this? What do you guys think? What are some of the digital um, questions, one? What are some of the community questions, two? What are some of the pitfalls you may imagine, three? What are some of the cool things that you can see, four? And then on the other side, we have values. Um, we're developing a statement of values that we hope to make public and to, what well, we plan to make public and transparent, but we hope to be able to continue to update it over the time that we're working, that will help cohere for us the ways in which we're making decisions based on uh, who's traveling and how are we dealing with the cost of travel, uh, both psychically, um, in our hearts, uh, how we feel about the impacts of the planet, how we're dealing with um, carbon offsets, um, how we're dealing with it publicly. Um, for those of you, and I imagine most people here are interested in this question, uh, it's very, very easy for people to shut us down by saying, well, you flew to a conference, you don't really care about climate change, for example. Mm -hmm. And, and we have, we've had that, um, of course. Um, but there's other ways to shut us down, too. Um, oh, you're doing climate change theater. That means it's going to be political, and I'm going to be bored, and you're going to tell me from your uh, usually left-leaning perspective that it's bad for me to use my car. Um, so we're looking at ways to disabuse people of this notion. Um, um, Miwa, the piece that you just showed in uh, at the Playhouse, you know, that first piece of you amid all of the weather, mm -hmm. those weather systems. I mean gorgeous, nothing to do, I don't know if it had to do with climate change for you, but for me it's so, it was so beautiful and brought me to a place of just sitting in my world and thinking about what it means to, to live and breathe on this planet. So those kinds of works, um, bringing those forward, that's part of the goal of this hub space outcome and why we want it to happen in so many different places around the world because Bigger stories right now seem to be gathering bigger moss, and maybe we want to be gathering some bigger moss around this question at this time. I think, does that give a pretty good answer? Yeah? Um, great. <laughs> now what? <laughs> maybe we should start with like more on the question. Yeah, so uh, we, we have, um, uh, as I say, we have a statement of values, and so some of the statement of values that we've thought of in very basic terms, just to get us going, are if we are to travel, we need to ensure that we do X. Mm -hmm. Or if we are to create, we need to ensure that it includes something. Um, if we are to use a certain material, we need to understand its impact. Uh, when planning meetings, we need to take uh, the following into account. So those are some, I don't know, starter ones. Um, would a question be, does that lead you to think about any others? Mm -hmm. Um, I've got one. Yeah. Yeah, oh, Alex. Um, 
uh, it's Alex speaking. Um, if we are to include the most diverse uh, participation, we need to do X. If we are, yeah. Mm -hmm. If we could write that. Yeah, we've got a whiteboard uh, just behind me, uh, so we'll be adding to that um, as we go. Okay. Could you repeat that if we are to include? If we are to include, yeah. or, yeah, if we are to include the most diverse uh, level of participation we need to do. Okay. Great. Thanks. I just have a, a question, I guess, based on all of the streaming experiences, mm -hmm. which is how to make the act of streaming a dialogue, a true di a, a, an effective dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, because I think some of the uh, situations have been uh, a, more successful than others in terms of it being an ongoing two-way conversation rather than observing something happening in another location. Yeah, this is a great thing I would love to talk about. There's some really good minds in the space who have some really good um, intel on that. Um, I will just st start off by saying that last year at Fulda, we had a, uh, a two-way conversation with uh, the Stratford Festival around um, some design elements for uh, Robert Lepage's uh, Coriolanus. And uh, we worked with... Um, uh, Martin, who was, who was working with us here and the National Arts Center in Stratford, he was able to send the same, um, uh, what I call a conversation box, to uh, Stratford, and we had the same one here, which meant that the two boxes were speaking the exact same language to one another, and therefore it made for an immediate back and forth conversation. There was no um, kind of translation. Um, when we did Choir, 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 we didn't have the um, um, literally the financial resources to be able to do that. And so the, bo the, the conversation boxes were all speaking a slightly different language. And as a result, the delay um, comes up because of that. It's possible with uh, the right amount of money and support to be able to have boxes that will speak the language. And so long as the um, uh, internet capacity is uh, good enough um, to, uh, to, uh, to expect uh, a pretty fluid two-way conversation. Uh, that's the goal for the hub spaces, not for the retreat parts. For the hub spaces, we, uh, we imagine that we'll need to move back from, say, a more idyllic, out-of-the-city um, venue and move into a theater or university setting where there's canary or higher-end um, connectivity, um, and then to get those um, boxes that speak the same language to be able to do so. But I think it's not just about even the technology, but it's about, like I thought choir, choir, choir was really interesting the other night because I actually cared about the people in the other places. Whereas in some of the other experiences, uh, like uh, Lucky Jew, uh, I kind of felt like I, I could be watching a newscast in a way, uh, and that it was kind of great, you know, when it became a question of do you want to get a coffee mug or something like that, you know. Then it felt a bit like a dialogue, whereas even with the technological glitches in Choir, 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 there were m moments, because they constantly brought those other people into the room, those other places into the room we were in, and because uh, we had moments like when somebody said, does anybody know anybody in any of the other rooms, and then somebody brought their baby out, you know, that, that, that you, I felt like I had a connection with each of those rooms of people. And, um, and then it was really interesting when Montreal, when they left, I kept thinking, it's heartbreaking that I'm looking at an empty room. Mm -hmm. Like, why did you leave, you know? And, and I felt like, in a way, even though there were glitches te technologically, that I was emotionally engaged because of how the choir, choir, choir people moderated the dialogue in a way. So I think that that was a really interesting kind of lesson to see. Kevin, do you? Uh, this is Kevin speaking. I just, I've, uh, not totally related to what I I just had a question about the intent behind the, like, the questions and the, mm -hmm. is there like an intent behind the work in terms of um, is the work intended to uh, encourage change, 
or to reflect what's going on? I, I guess that's kind of a question that I would have before I could pose a value. Right, that's uh, a great question. I mean, we've subtitled it Reimagining the Footprint, and um, each of the cycles have been dedicated towards, uh, towards change. Um, however, for me personally, um, I would place the caveat that with respect to climate change, uh, changes, <laughs> changes in the word is in the is in the is in the thinking already. So um, there's been so much compelling writing, and I I suspect there's going to be so much more as uh, as the realities of what we are witnessing and. Uh, that, that I feel very personally uncertain as to what needs to change. Um, and I don't feel like I will ever be enough of an authority to know in any macro way what needs to change. So what I, as a dramaturg at heart, am most interested in is understanding what's going on and trying to get a sense of what's going on. And I don't really know what's going on. I mean, I, I go to Thousand Isles Playhouse, which, you know, I started working there when I was a kid. And to, to, to look at that dock, mm. I mean, it's, it, it's, it, it's, it's really frightening. It's, it's, I just can't understand it. You know, I, I, I know what's happening. I, we talk about it. I know I can rationalize it. But so to your question, I think these values are for me, it's such a great question. For me, there are ways to be able to say, I understand your critique. This is how we're working. I hear you, and maybe we can adjust, as opposed to, yeah, I guess that's. So, I maybe offer one? Yeah. Um, from, uh, I was at this uh, Green New Deal event this week, and one of the ideas that they brought up was like, we, we have to move at the speed that's required. So I guess yeah, my, right. we have to move at the speed that's required. Mm -hmm. So I guess my value would be if we are to move at the speed that's truly required by climate change, we have to X. Right. Mm -hmm. um, that's a great, that's a great one. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Can you repeat that one more time? Um, if we have to move at the speed required by climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wonder if there's a follow up, but move healthily or move responsibly mm -hmm. at the speed? Yeah, this is Ramona speaking. Um, that reminds me of a quote that um, Adrienne Marie Brown has. She's a, um, a, the author of this book called Emergent Strategy, and she says, move at the speed of trust, um, which is something that uh, I think is um, both like hand in hand and a counterpoint to that a little bit and sp sort of specifically speaking of doing work um, with specific communities, right? Like you, you move at the speed that the trust between people is, is developing because if you move too fast before there's trust there, then, uh, then the work sort of falls apart or um, you, know, you run the risk of, of doing harm. Um, so yeah, I think balancing like the the necessity with the with the human trust. It also feels like it's about a, a code of values that are adoptable by people in different theaters with different intentions. They may not be doing all climate change work, but they could take the value of we're recycling our sets now, or we're going to do. There, there are actions that the theaters can take. We're going to use all LED lights instead of using the old lights. We're gonna, like, what are the different steps as a field that we can take to lower the carbon footprint of what we put into the world mm -hmm. as creators? Did you say a value? I didn't get to a value. <laughs> I, was speaking, I was speaking about, I, I was speaking about a, a thing to do with the values. Yeah. <laughs> a thing that, like, a way to enlist, um, you know, a code of conduct from our, our, our field. Um, I think mm. that there was some, I wasn't at TCG, so somebody who was should speak. I understand there was a lot of stuff around climate change and that there was some discussion around these, this issue, particularly about as a field, what we could do. Were you there? Uh, I know the people who put it together. Yeah, yeah. it's a, a, a new green theater. They're trying to put together, based on the Green New Deal, right. something that would be, a, like you said, code of conduct for the field at large. Yeah. yeah. 
And I'm Krista. Sorry. Oh, thank you. It's Charles speaking. I wanted to propose maybe if we are to retreat for the first conversation, we should consider X. Because the idea mm -hmm. of retreating is interesting when such an enormous part of the world's population are living in urban centers, and that's perhaps one of the key drivers of climate change and industry. So as we retreat to a natural, quote unquote, environment, are we unincluding the majority of some populations who live in urban centers? Is there like a gentrification question of who can go to that retreated space safely and monetarily and have that conversation? And what is the way that that space is managed? Like a lot of parks run in a non-sustainable way, the way they burn energy in the winter just to heat the buildings which are not cost effective. Mm -hmm. So there are some things to think about, I think, for that first meeting. Yeah. yeah. Would you be able to, if we are to retreat for the first conversation? If we are to retreat, we should or? consider X. Okay. Yeah. May I add one more thing? Just in, with what Sean was saying, I thought Quiet Fire Fire was amazing, but there was an element of, there was a central location and satellite locations that were commenting on or were re responding to the central location. And in a decentralized conversation like mm -hmm. climate change, mm -hmm. I would be very afraid of having an Ottawa driving the ship mm -hmm. and having people feeling like they were subsidiary conversations. Well, interestingly, that's a great, great question. And interestingly, next year, if this works, uh, Kingston will be the, the place that's the small, like, right. will be the, the smallest center of any of those. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the, I, don't, I don't see a center, which right. is really interesting. And other than, uh, other than a command central, yes. which of course becomes a center and becomes a way in which a, a conversation is considered, but, um, Really, yeah. There won't there won't be a, there won't necessarily be a bigger audience here. Yeah, um, yeah and you know, Vancouver. Uh, some of the feedback was Vancouver felt um, like they they felt that the show was happening for us, but Toronto <coughs> didn't because they knew the 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 band so well. Yeah. They knew mm -hmm. the, the duo so well. Yeah. Oh. So there's that uh -huh. too about relationship, you know. Um, I have a, a question, which is that uh, in, in looking at the different hubs, um, is it that we're trying to deal with reducing transportation? And the reason I ask is that uh, I've come from Toronto, so it's possible Toronto would be a hub, but I'm having a totally different kind of experience because I'm in this physical environment. And it's a great physical environment, uh, and it's taken me out of my normal pattern. So I could drive my super fuel efficient car and pack it full of people and still, like I, I would still have a very different experience physically being here than I would have physically being in Toronto. So is it, is it that we are trying to reduce transportation or is it that transportation is one element of which there may be others that we're trying to reconsider in thinking of a, a new shape mm -hmm. or a different shape? I mean, if I understand your question, I think, yeah, we're interested in, in seeing what the new shapes are. We, we, we're, we've moved headlong into technology, um, or we've been moved headlong into technology. Um, uh, travel is... Um, is absolutely a privilege, and we can now measure its uh, its carbon uh, its carbon costs. Um, maybe uh, I'm sure I'm not the only one in the room here. Uh, if infrastructure goes down, I don't know which will go down first: will it be travel or will it be the internet? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But this is another way of thinking mm -hmm. about connectivity across you know across distance. Um, uh, I also know that I was initially inspired by the question of um, artists that I was working, that I was making work with in uh, in Iqaluit, and um, uh, they told the story of the way in which they make work. 
which is this at the time. It's, it's already begun to change a little bit, but at the time they said, we're cabaret artists because we can only gather to make work for one day with somebody from another community. Because for me to fly from the Callowit to Pond Inlet to be with my closest artistic uh, creator is $3,000. And then for us to travel to another place is another $3,000. And then if, say we do a show with 15 artists, all 15 of us have to travel down south to Ottawa before we can start to tour across Canada and be seen. So for me at that time, and that was at the beginning of this whole the very first cycle, actually, I began to think, well, what are the ways that we can think differently about that? Um, obviously, there's an enormous environmental cost to uh, not, not travel, extraction, resources, so many things that are happening that probably within this room are somewhat out of our control, but uh, maybe offering other ways to think about how we can communicate and make work and co-presence, which I really hope Mia might speak a little bit about to know if there's more potential for co-presencing across this, um, the, the offers of technology. Um, also, yeah. also, I guess I would add that, um, there's, there, you know, like if you hadn't come here and this had happened and you had joined from a, from a long distance, it would be different, but there's going to be no this here. Yeah. So people are going to gather in each of these hubs and that's where this stuff is going to happen. So maybe that makes it slightly different. Each hub is a locality. Yes, and each hub is creating something on its own. Mm -hmm. It's not from your desk. Yeah. I think that's, you know, because computers, you know, you're like, oh yeah, sure, I'll go to that retreat. And you're, you know, but it does force a movement out of your, out of your pattern, which, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So, it's a, um, a couple of things I'm going to do a little bit of train of thought. Um, well, I'm, I'm interested in this uh, values and then also practices. So I feel like as things shift, sometimes we build practices. But the context around us shifts, and our practices are actually no longer helpful. So like how, how do, so this framework of if we are to, we need to do, yeah, I'm, I'm struggling with that a little bit, right? Like what do we need to be? What do we need to think about? What do we need to um, uh, um, consider? Um, which gives us a little more creativity, a little more flexibility around practices down, down the pike. Um, and I was really responding to something you said, Sarah, about um, when folks come and want to, I'm trying to remember the word you said, but basically like knock it down, knock it down and say like, this isn't real, this isn't real. And there's a, a, a brilliant writer in Mississippi uh, named Kaisi Lehman, and I had to look it up to get it right, and he says, there might be rigorous, honest work to be done by grounding our critiques, at least partially in our complicity. And so I started thinking about how do you hold complicity and vision simultaneously? Mm -hmm. And so I think if I, if I lean into your, this framework, like if we are to hold the complexity of, the, of climate change, or even like it hold the complexity of um, our relationship to climate change, we need to do, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I could just build on that a little bit, when um, Ramona, you were um, quoting from Emergent Strategies, mm -hmm. uh, Move at the Speed of Trust, I was thinking, well, do we need to do kind of a whole think session on what trust, like what trust means in terms of moving that speed forward, you know, like what does this what is this group? What, what would trust look like in this group versus trust in another group? And then what would the speed then be of, like it, it might take this group, I don't know, 62 days and 15 minutes, and it might take another group three minutes. I don't know, you know, and, um, but that, sh the, yeah. And, and, and just because I've been in this conversation with a bunch of folks, the difference that feels like between personal trust and political trust. Mm. And those are, those are, those be two very different things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Sure. Um, in thinking about uh, organizing um, around um, issues, you can be in, you can have a, you can be in political trust with someone. I trust their vision, their, their, that they're moving in a similar, that we are aligned in what we're moving forward. I might not be having dinner with them though. Right, like the, there's this difference between like personal trust. Mm -hmm. I trust you to do, um, it's like trust accountability, right? I trust you to 
um, stay inside these um, parameters of the work that we're doing together that we have agreed on, like this idea, like how do you unpack what trust is? But um, I feel like sometimes the this this phrase "moving at the speed of trust" becomes this this like well a personal feeling, right? Like I I need to like you in order to work with you, or which is not bad. You know, we should love the people who work with us. Fabulous. And <laughs> like I'm wandering around with people I don't like. But, um, uh, from a political analysis, I, I just want to say, you know, that, that feels to me, and, and this is a conversation that some folks and I have been having, a difference between what it means to build political trust to move an organizing agenda forward, and then what it is personal trust around, like, your family, your friends, and who. Do you think both ought to be included in this value? Like, one or the other? Honestly, I don't know. Um, I would say for sure being clear about the difference so that this idea of like using the same words that people can mean, that's what made me think about it. So it's like, what, how do you define trust? Mm -hmm. And so I think that for me is at the core, whether it's political, personal, or all different kinds of trust that may be out there that um, you know, people aren't naming, um, but just being clear amongst the folks in the room of mm -hmm. what that trust entails and what that means. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I, and I actually think what Sage, Sage's question about complexity, I think, is probably getting to what I was thinking, and she's probably said it much more articulately, <laughs> but I, I, when we were talking about the hubs, I was thinking, yeah, you know, it's because this is such a complex um, area, and uh, if we are honoring um, the respect for travel and meeting in spaces that will bring probably similar people together because of proximity. Um, it would be, I think, really useful to, have to ensure that we have um, access to the conversations that are happening in other locations that we don't have proximity to because inevitably where we are living and where we gather is going to have an impact on what we talk about. So I was just wanting to ensure that there's some way that the complexity of those conversations depending on those locations, is shared widely. Yeah, well, I mean, to unpack the, uh, the vision at this point for that is that the public outcome at the end, hub space, uh, will be a two-day, starts on a Friday evening and culminates on a Sunday morning at lunch, basically, a two-day uh, extravaganza which will share uh, across eight spaces. Um, those uh, personal ways into particular a particular set of questions that are arrived at by each of the hubs and throughout the year of building towards that that we that we set in motion for each of those um, groups to look at so it's the the, the scope is um, the scope is really large but the but we're hoping that each hub will hold its own kind of Ground literally as to how they're uh, they're digging into the, the set of questions that get asked, and by set of questions I should say that you know it's this is a, a theater uh, inquiry. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's you know it comes out of uh, what's called English theater at Canada's National Arts Center. So we we come to this question from the perspective of theater slash performance, but we don't even have performance in the name of, of what we do, so, you know, theater. So um, part of it, um, Kevin Matthew Wong who spoke earlier, last year his show Chemical Valley Project was here uh, at the, the first FOLDA and it just happened in, in Toronto and it's a piece um, that centers around questions uh, pertaining to climate change, uh, pathetic fallacy that Anita Roshan is doing tonight, that centers around it, work that um, Chantal has done um, focuses on that. Um, just saw some work this afternoon and some of the work that um, was shared in the U.S.-Canada exchange. Part of the, the job of this is also to share the work that exists that's already really cool, really exciting, and so that people are like, don't fall into thinking that it's going to be a bunch of people with, I don't know, placards saying, down with Trump or whatever, you know, like that there's such a sophisticated, interesting way into it. Some of the VR work, you know, Wojciech, that you've shown, certainly I think there's so much, there's so many different ways that our creative engagement, I think, can, can blow people's minds in the best possible way. Um, 
So it's not just about conversations, the hub spaces at the at the at the end. It's really about a, uh, a meeting place of conversation and performance, um, and hopefully a really good party. And that's the part I haven't quite figured. You know, like how how there's going to be a party that can happen in some simultaneity or some shared. Af I don't know something that people can really feel that it's that they're affecting one another in, in the way that I was affected during Choir, 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 and that there is like a sense of something happening at the same time for people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I threw, uh, this is Angela, um, I threw a launch party with uh, Winnipeg Reykjavik, mm -hmm. and I would be so happy to help you with that. Great. Yeah, you. no, really, because there are some fun, interesting ways of getting people chatting and playing in parties uh, with oceans between them. I would love to help. Great. <laughs> yeah, I want to say this is Sophie. I put on the board um, without. <laughs> it's easier for me to write it and then say, maybe. But I, I put on the board, given the resources of the project, can we create and make available a rubric for other companies to take up? If so, we need to X. I guess that's sort of an idea of like, oh, how can this project actually um, create possibilities for others to follow? Yeah. Something Great. that's on my mind a lot, and I'm involved in a transnational performance project that is addressing the climate crisis right now, and um, and we convene uh, over the internet to create together. And one of the things that I'm like really sitting with, and it's a tension for me, is like uh, the internet is car not carbon neutral, <laughs> right? And I feel like that hasn't been entered into this conversation. I think we proceed often with this perception of it being a neutral space, a carbon neutral space, and it's not. And so um, I think how to address that inside of any, and, and that may be an impossibility when we are increasingly connected and trying to create work across often imposed borders uh, that address global context, how to contend with this very actually uh, material fact of the lack of neutrality of the ways in which we're convening and the impact of that and how to even measure that. And that's not something I've figured out at all. And it's not something that we've had extensive conversations with in, in this particular project that I'm referring to. But I think there's a tension there. Um, and I think, and, and drawing from that project, what we have adopted is emergent strategy as the design principle from which we are working, creating relationships, addressing our um, shared and divergent political concerns, and finding ways to create uh, aesthetically uh, depthful work across vast locations, both like um, our positionalities in relationship to the complexes of power and our positionalities in, in geographic <laughs> relationship to one another. So, um, and I wouldn't say we've like adopted the entire text, but there are certain principles inside of that work that really are guiding the foundation of how we are endeavoring to work together. Um, and what does it mean to work in an emergent way uh, is I think a big, um, it's, a, it's like a very fruitful, problem to address to ourselves. Um, yeah. So I don't have a synthesis of any of that, sorry. <laughs> if, if I could respond to your first, your, your first point, um, uh, Ian Garrett, who uh, we met the other day from Prague, he was part of the, uh, he was one of the inspirers at the summit, and, and he raised, um, uh, he, he actually has the data on the costs of, of technology, and it's far from neutral. And in fact, um, I had a real crisis uh, the day that, it, that I learned of that because this whole thing was very, uh, I, I also led that session on the first day about digital utopias. Like I was the, I was like, it's amazing. There's no paper, there's no travel, it's amazing. And then he just laid out all the information. And I was like, it's terrible. We can't do this. So actually one of our goals for next year is to be able to make that um, information um, accessible and uh, and sort of have the, the formulas available for people so they can understand it because he went through just very in very limited fashion you know what it is for me to send an email to you sitting across the room or for us to share Google Docs or any of that stuff it's it's far from neutral so 
It's a really important point and, and a difficult one. Um, but it br brought us, it's actually, it was that, that conversation that um, gave rise to us thinking about a statement of values because, uh, Sage, I think you raised the word complexity, but like it's just to, to move into one, one step here raises the other, with the other foot, the other question, you know? So, um, yeah, I don't know, maybe the statement, yeah, it's just a, it's just a help me for, dealing with this. And then in terms of the emergent as design, um, I guess one of the questions that has come up for us on this land is, you know, we, we tend to use more and more decolonizing or indigenizing, but I, 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 don't, I don't believe the leadership exists um, necessarily in this room. And so it's trying to understand how to focus, how to, how to, who's not in the room, as Cole, uh, Cole Alvis would always say, and, and uh, he's a, a thinker and creator and director from Toronto, but, but how, do we, how, do we, how do we find the right guides through the question of this, of this moment, I guess, is, uh, is part of the question. So if emergent strategy is one, I think, Maybe it would be great to learn more from you on that. I'm yeah. happy to share the document that we great. Uh, yeah. created that is a synthesis of how we're trying to approach this project. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd be happy to share that widely. It's not super deep, <laughs> but it's a, yeah, it's like a one pager. Thank you. Yeah, and happy to have conversations too. Um, this is Wes. I mean, there are two things I would add, like to add. As far as guides, um, one, um, I mean, I think Sage can attest to this because you are quoted in the book several times. Mm -hmm. um, but um, Emergent Strategy is actually the book document of, like, Beware of the Dandelions, which was our performance. And so that actually was developed in parallel with each other. and. Um, a lot of the metaphors and the principles actually came out of the research that we were doing when developing that work. Um, so, like, I, I always love to just like go over and like talk about some of those things um, that come out of emergent strategy and like our collaboration with Adrian um, as she like wrote and then like we created like an artistic expression of kind of those principles. Um, but the other thing is like. I would like to offer another guide um, that I, I've been involved with the process over the past three or four years um, that came out of the Allied Media Conference is um, these guiding principles called the design justice principles. And so it's just a set of 10 principles that I think um, overlay very well, not exactly with everything for like piece by piece, but are a good way to like think about, when you say about like leadership in the room, one of the principles are the prioritization of like people most impacted. Um, mm -hmm. And thinking about who is considered an expert, how expertise is taken into consideration um, and, to, and uplifting and valuing lived experience in this document of like how all these things fit together when creating a document such as this. Thanks for that one. Yeah. I think that, um, Vortex speaking, um, that if we um, want a real change, uh, we should probably, I think it's like a general, but we should think about changing society, changing politics, changing economy. Changing politics and economy, economy is uh, not that uh, easy, I suppose. Uh, but um, I think um, from our um, perspective, uh, we can um, change society. I mean, we can try to change um, knowledge and um, and attitude of people. Um, so, um, how can we um, do it so that this kind of activities reach 
uh, big scale for um, a lot of people. Mm, so I suppose my value would be, uh, and I believe in change, and uh, there are some very good examples how certain campaigns changed the uh, attitude of people. For example, Bogota started to be not so uh, violent city within several um, good decisions. Uh, but so my question would be, um, if we are to make a great impact of, uh, on society or on people regarding climate change, uh, we should do X. If we are going to have, can you say again? Uh, to make an impact on um, mm, society or big amount of people. Right. Or if we are to reach with our goals uh, to a big number of people. Mariel speaking. Um, that just made me think of a TED talk that I watched the other day by her name is Helen Marriage out of the UK. She does huge large scale large scale public artworks and she had this one piece that she produced by a company um, out of France, Royal Deluxe, who does giant puppets. Mm -hmm. And I, I just bring it up because talking about all of this, I've been feeling really, really stressed out. And what you said, Kevin, it's like overwhelming. And I'm like, I wouldn't go to, <laughs> I wouldn't go to this because it, it's an echo chamber. And I'm like, I, I, I just feel, I feel so useless. But when you said, what you said, Wojciech, I felt, ah, we're artists, we can imagine an alternate future. We can, like, playfulness and creativity, can we? And then I realized, well, maybe, maybe we do have a place in this. And I thought of this piece and her work just because she turned, she shut down London for four days to bring in a giant, like, bigger than a building. I don't know if it's eco-friendly, but um, they built this puppet that was so huge and uh, to like an elephant and a little girl uh, and they it, she engaged with the city for four days and people like thousands and thousands of people all came into the streets to engage with the work and I just was like people were crying and were so moved and I yeah I just imagine like for me a, a hub somehow sounds like an echo chamber but how do we get out of the echo chamber and into the streets or a, a, outside of that to inspire or to play. I don't have any values, I'm just talking. <laughs> and then when millions are in the streets, then something can happen. Yeah, like, maybe we can mm. tie the raptors in. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, all those, all those things are so much about like joy and connectivity and people feeling uh, a sense of shared value or shared like that we're here, like that we're all here. And um, and I suppose that's part of the the attempt. It's, it's interesting hearing you say that, that you're like, you see this and you think, oh, I wouldn't go because it would stress me out too much. I mean, our hope is that at the outcome, it's about joy and celebration. Not because it's like, oh, great, climate change is happening, but more because there's, well, in part, an acknowledgement can offer a sense of power and, and, uh, and movement, but more, to uh, to bring more people into the conversation, mm -hmm. but yeah, I hear you. Like I think, oh God, well maybe how this, you know, maybe that's too much of a closed image. I don't, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, our colleague who's watching along on the live stream uh, just wanted to put another um, sort of guide into the room. Uh, it's the work of the Climate Justice Alliance, which is an alliance of grassroots groups um, centering marginalized communities across the U.S. Um, and they have a just transition framework, which details their thinking and work um, on moving from extractive economies and worldviews to regenerative ones. Um, or regenerative ones. 
um, and it's at climatejusticealliance.org. Um, and that's from Jax Gill, who's gonna be back around later if anybody's curious. Thank you. We have about uh, five minutes. Um, I, I've, I've loved this. I mean, I feel, um, To have an opportunity just to ask a question, and uh, I, I, I don't, I, I have no idea what other people feel about um, how to take on the question of climate change, but to be able to sit in a room and at least talk about it um, fills me with a tremendous sense of uh, gratitude. Um, just to be able to bring it forward, and I, and also um, to be okay with feeling unintelligent about it. Um, I feel like I constantly say that stuff in public and it, it may sound disingenuous, but actually I just, I, I don't know, I'm trying to learn skills with which to talk about it and to be able to set up frameworks and ways that we can talk about it. Um, in the early, or the late 90s I ran a theater company in Toronto called Buddies and Bad Times Theater and, um, and uh, it was a very specific queer mandate and I had a distant relationship in some ways with the um, sort of identity-based locality of it at, at the time. Um, and my dad was an engineer, and so I, I've since learned that Derrida, you know, some academic or whatever, but anyway, somebody smart was already talking about this, but at the time I was just thinking about structures for desire. And for me, these cycles are structures um, where a lot of energy is being put in place so that we can have these difficult conversations and hopefully not feel completely dis, uh, disengaged, but hopefully feel uh, utterly engaged at the end. I mean, that's the goal. Um, and so I see these cycles as actually um, durational performances that start at the beginning of the question and maybe conclude, not quite sure, at the end of the two years. Um, or at least maybe our creative part of it concludes and something new happens. Um, so, uh, that's me. No, just thank you for being willing to um, think through these things with us. It's very useful. Um, it's very in progress, so these, all these different things are going to um, inform how we move forward. And if you'd like to be, not if you'd like to be involved, if we can call on you, we <laughs> would like to. But uh, if you have any thoughts that you feel you want to share after that come up, please do, because uh, we'll take them. We'll really take them. Yeah. Can I do a little plug that the Green New Theater crew, who one of them is my one of my dearest collaborators, um, they actually have an upcoming Zoom call on June eighteenth that you can log into. Um, and it'll be from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. EST, and I will um, get that information and then share it on the Slack. Great. <laughs> but um, yeah, like just as we were talking, their first principle was posted, and their first principle is community accountability. Just if you're interested, so um, just to know that this conversation is really active in, in multiple localities, and I think that that's exciting. And, 